um, Dr. Um, um, Bailey Taylor is our speaker today. She is a gerontarian, so <laughs> something of interest to all of us, I imagine. And she's going to be talking about a topic that is very interesting to all of us, probably. Uh, it is um, the brain and how it might change as we age and how to stay, keep a healthier brain. And uh, anyway, she has, um, she has some points that she will uh, make that you might want to have a pad and a pencil to write down. So if you want to quickly grab something, <laughs> that'd be good. And in the meantime, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Melissa Bailey Taylor. Uh, she um, got her, her education started at Spelman College and then uh, went to Ohio State uh, before um, uh, rounding out her, her mind and her uh, decision to be uh, a full doctor. Kind of, uh, she said, really following in her mother's footsteps in a sense. And I'd like for uh, Dr. Bailey Taylor to explain that to you. Um, this uh, is a timely project because this past year, I don't know with you, but for me has been extremely hard. I, I thrive, I get my energy from other people. So just seeing your names here on my, my screen helps me. So thank you for coming. Uh, Dr. Bailey Taylor, would you please take it away? All right, thank you. Hello, everyone. It's an honor to be able to talk to you today. And yes, um, I was became interested in geriatrics, kind of the reverse way. My mother is a nurse and worked in long-term care as an administrative nurse um, regionally for her company and also director of nursing. And I actually told her, I think one time that I was not going to work in the nursing home. And actually I work in the nursing home. I'm a medical director now and I love it. Um, I think what it was at that time, I didn't know how I could cause change that was positive and how I could help people. But I've since learned that my father is also a great inspiration in this area. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen and I will go through our presentation. If you have questions, please put them in the chat and we'll also have time at the end where you can directly ask those questions as well. Um, just for your information, I'm a family medicine physician and I'm also board certified in geriatrics. And I work, um, our main office is the Center for Success and Aging in Patewood um, with Prisma Health, but we're actually through all over the region providing care for our um, seniors or some like to be called the trendsetters. <laughs> those that are 50 years old and older. All right. So do you see my screen? Does everybody see it? Okay, we excellent. Sure do. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. I will start my show here. All right, so this is just our usual business slide of who I am and who I am talking in front of. Um, and our topic today is dementia, the basics of dementia. All right, what we are going to do, my plan for us today is we had our introductions. We're going to meet some patients that are gonna help us learn about this topic. We'll go through the basics of dementia. There are different types of dementia. And also we're gonna see if we can figure out what type of dementia our patients have that we're gonna be introduced to in a few minutes. And then some further information and next steps, such as how to prevent or lessen the effects of dementia. Okay. Our first patient that we have that I'd like to introduce you to is Mrs. May Lee. She's a 65 year old female who we are seeing in the hospital. Actually today I'm in the hospital, our geriatric team. Um, she was admitted secondary to having a sudden slurring of speech while she was in the grocery store. She also had left-sided weakness while shopping. Her family noted that she has had strange behavior where she does not know all of a sudden where she is or what she was doing. 
and she's also been more tearful. This has been a big change. Our next patient that we have is Mrs. Mary Blue. She's 80 years old. She is a newcomer to the region. And I guess for her, some people have lived here for 20 years. She's only been here since March of 2020. Um, she came to live with her husband after, I mean, her son after her husband died. Um, and prior to moving, she was independent, driving her car, going to volunteer activities, no challenges whatsoever. Now she's having some difficulty dressing herself. She's lost about 10 pounds in three weeks and having difficulty staying asleep and staying focused. Our third patient is Mr. Mark Winter. He's a 58-year-old male. He works part-time as an accountant. So as we say, some people never retire. They can just keep going. They switch to new hobbies and occupations. He was brought to the memory clinic, um, like at our downtown or Pakewood office. And the reason why he was brought in is because he's been exhibiting some odd behaviors where he's been very insensitive to his wife, his coworkers. He voided, for example, in the garden instead of walking into the bathroom in his home. He laughed at a coworker who fell down and injured himself. And he's been eating everything that's in the pantry. And that's not his normal behavior. We also have Mr. Juan Soto. Mr. Soto is a seven-year-old male. He was, um, his family brought him to the doctor's office because he's gotten lost multiple times on a route that he's driven for at least 10 years. He doesn't seem to care about being tidy anymore, where in the past he's extremely organized and very particular about that. He's also very paranoid and having trouble putting on his clothes or the appropriate clothes for the weather. Okay, so before we start, those are our four patients. And I just wanted to ask you all, what are, when someone says dementia, what do you think of? What words come to mind? If you can unmute and share a couple, or if you could put it in the chat. That's a short confusion, loss of short-term memory. Okay. Very good. Anyone else? Loss of interest in life. Okay. And anyone else? Change personality. Change personality. Okay. Forgetting simple things. Okay. It, Paranoia. It, Paranoia. Okay. Inappropriate responses, you know, crying when you should be laughing, uh, laughing when you're crying, anger, etc. Okay. Very good. Okay. Excellent. So this is just our word cloud for dementia. And like you all said, there's a variety of words that come to mind and descriptors that describe um, dementia from, like you said, um, inappropriate responses to activities, um, change in personalities and so forth, confusion, um, feeling lost, depression. Now a question that we have with this, since we're talking about dementia, is dementia a normal part of aging? What are your thoughts? I should say, anybody feel that dementia is a normal part of aging? Any yeses? No. No. I think it's a common part, but doesn't necessarily have to be a normal part. Okay, awesome. All right. And you are correct, no, dementia is not a normal part of aging, but it does occur frequently. And actually the prevalence has been increasing. And so we don't know all the reasons why, but they are there. And that's part of some of the areas that we do research in to try to figure out what is going on and how we can attack this. Okay, so here are some seniors and this is normal. <laughs> So oftentimes when we talk about dementia, we want to also talk about what is normal aging because some people will come and it's okay. We'd rather for you to come in and find out that there's nothing wrong in our office than to think, is there something going on? And, and if the sooner we find out what's happening or if there's a problem, we can intervene. 
So as the slide is showing you, some examples of normal aging is like you might forget something that occurred maybe a year ago or maybe 10 years ago. However, the difference with dementia is where one can't remember what happened, say, yesterday at all, or what one had for breakfast, and it's maybe noontime. Another thing is finding words. Um, sometimes we have trouble, we don't remember a particular word. I know sometimes I get stuck on the, I don't know why, or I can't remember how to spell it. It's just not coming to mind. But the difference with dementia is where one cannot carry on a conversation because one cannot find the words, even a substitute word, to put in for that lack of memory. Also, um, another example is forgetting names of new friends. Hmm. We all sometimes have, like, for whatever reason, maybe we're distracted, so we didn't remember something. But with dementia, is forgetting the names and even the faces of your loved one, your children, your spouse, if you have one, or your partner. Another example is misplacing an item, but finding it later. Um, with dementia, you're unable to retrace those steps. Another one is making bad decisions occasionally. We all are human, but when we see that one is consistently exhibiting poor judgment and logic decisions, and that's the logic that's the norm for the region in which you live in, that's more of a sign of dementia. Um, also, being unable to recall the day, month, and year, or the season, versus maybe not remembering, okay, you're on vacation and today is Tuesday. You know, as long as you know how to get back on the plane to get home, that's a normal part of aging. <laughs> Very good. All right. So dementia is a disease process. I know sometimes family members will come in and say, mom is just being difficult. She's trying to be mean to us. And the actual fact is mom may not be intentionally doing those things at all, but this is a disease process um, and it occurs in the brain. We use the term dementia as an umbrella term or a blanket term. A lot of people have heard of Alzheimer's dementia, which is just one of the types of dementia. Um, the exact mechanism is not known for all of the types of dementia. Risk factors include previous like head injuries, mental health, chronic diseases that are untreated or poorly treated like heart disease, diabetes, depression, um, substance abuse, lack of social support, um, inactivity. Those are all known risk factors for dementia as well as hereditary genetics. Um, and so we're gonna go in a little deeper into what is dementia. And that's just, this is just an example of some of the various types. Some of you may have heard of from Parkinson's um, disease with dementia and vascular dementia, Alzheimer's dementia. Uh -oh. So we also use the term cognitive impairment. And again, this is a broad term. And this is when there's any dysfunction in the brain. And it's a derangement of the ability to recall. One is unable to focus, concentrate, process information, and so forth. And dementia, you'll see, involves or is when there's cognitive impairment. Okay. There's different areas of the brain. They each do different things, um, such as the front part of your brain, if you all touch that there, that's usually what we, that area of the brain we use for planning, organizing, learning new information, and also for like self-control or things that we may think, but we wouldn't say to someone because that would be hurtful. Um, if you touch the back of your head, that's where our occipital lobe is. And that's how we recognize shapes and objects and how we're able to walk upright, not walk sideways or fall. Also, um, we have our temporal lobe, which is the lower part of our brain. Um, and that's where we have our memory, recognizing objects, names, and our speech, and our parietal um, area of the brain that you see here. And that's where we look at space, perception, sides, where we coordinate um, reading and writing. Okay. With dementia, dementia is disease in any of these parts of the brain. Okay. Now, I talked to you about the cognitive impairment. So in our brain, we have about six different areas. And going back to this slide, and they control different areas of function. Dementia is when we have the two of these areas have impairment or, or abnormal. 
memory is one of the areas that's most often affected. But as some people have dementia where they have an excellent memory, but they have other impairments. So these are examples again of these domains where you have complex attention and you have executive function. That's the one that we talk a lot about, like handling the tasks, like planning a dinner party, balancing your checkbook, learning in memory, short-term memory um, things, um, repeating a story, a phrase, language, um, being able to understand what someone was saying or also being able to use language that you've learned from elementary or your earlier years. We have motor function, um, the ability to like button your shirt or to walk and social cognition. And that's more like your emotional state and personality. So some of you may be aware, and I think you said that, where dementia isn't a normal part of aging, but a large number of people have dementia. So there, studies have shown or research have shown that there are about 50 million people with dementia or dementia-related diagnosis. And about 5 million people in the US are age 65 or older. And this population, our population, the trendsetters, as I was talking about, are growing. So in about 2050, it's estimated that we'll have about 16 million seniors or older adults with dementia. And this also has a significant cost. Right now, it costs about $305 billion to take care of everyone with this disorder. Now, we're going to start, again, diving a little further into the different types of dementia. Mild cognitive impairment, and I don't know if any of you have heard this, but this is where one only has one area of dysfunction, like when I showed you the picture of the brain. And people that have mild cognitive impairment, most of them will not develop dementia. They will just have an impairment, one area that's hard. Maybe it's hard for them to do, you know, process things like numbers, or may, usually it's memory. Now they say about 20 to 30% will develop dementia. So in the past, it was a separate diagnosis. Some researchers feel that it's on the continuum and we don't know why or what causes a switch to click on and someone actually develops dementia. But a good number of people will have this mild cognitive impairment. All right, so out of the four patients, and I know we went through them briefly, which of our patients do you think fits this description? Any volunteers? We've all forgotten them. Yes, I was thinking about, you know, it happens. <laughs> well, we'll talk about Miss Mary Blue. So she is our lady that fits this description. Also, one of the things that um, we have to do when we look and someone comes to see us to determine whether they have dementia is to determine whether they have a mimicker. So for instance, depression. Miss Mary Blue really has signs of depression and untreated depression can look like dementia. The behaviors, the response and so forth. So it's good and we always try to deal with the underlying causes if we can, because really she doesn't have dementia, but depression. Now, a thing that you guys may hear about sometimes when you come into the doctor, you hear on the news, um, is activities of daily living. And what we mean by that are things like bathing, grooming, um, getting up from the chair and walking across the room, eating, things that we might take for granted unless you have a loved one or spouse or yourself. And if you have these challenges in this area, then they become a little bit more pronounced or in our forefront of our thoughts. The other term that we hear a lot about is instrumental activities of daily living. And those are things like using the telephone, like our basic landline telephone, to the smartphones, to preparing a meal, to taking medicines, or even some people have to take two medicines. Some people take 20 medicines, but being able to manage that, managing money, those are instrumental activities of living, of daily living. Okay. I feel we'll go, we'll go on. Um, in our dementia workup, 
again, we'll ask several questions because the most important thing is to find out about one's history. So history of chronic diseases, hospitalization, stressors, lifestyle changes, family history. And again, we do this to rule out things that can dilute or confuse the picture. Things like substance abuse, depression, cancers that have not been treated or maybe at the end of the cancer stage or disease process can also affect how we think and how we feel. And so it's very important that we ask lots of questions. Also looking at maybe a loved one that's been to the hospital maybe like three times in one month, that's kind of concerning. Or someone that just all of a sudden their behavior is not how it should be. Or someone who's refusing to take a bath in like a month and what is going on. So those are some of the things that are very important for us to know to help with the workup of dementia. Also, if you see these things in a friend, a loved one, that you could be encouraging to help them to also seek care early. Okay, we'll review medications. Some of the studies that we do, I won't go through all the details, but we look at things from what's in your blood, from your electrolytes or salts in your body to vitamins, because it can affect how well you think and how you process, to things like heavy metals, um, things like even syphilis, where some people may not have known that they've been exposed to syphilis and it's in the tertiary stage, which could be in the brain. Or I don't know if any of you remember mad cow disease that was, I think, in the 80s from usually meat that came from Europe. Um, and so that is, it's called pyron disease, is also a cause for some dementias. And in our workup, we do referrals like to psychiatry, infectious disease, if needed. We also use several different tools as um, health professionals to screen for dementia. And some of you might have had some of these tools. Maybe your physician has given you or asked you some of the questions or had you do some of the activities. And some of these are you, you're able to use them repeatedly and it doesn't cause a user bias or, and then some um, with that factor, we use it serially to kind of track and see how you're doing. A common one is called the MOCA, and this is where you're drawing, you're connecting numbers, drawing a shape, um, telling us what type of animal this is. You're doing some things with language, like we want you to tap your leg or the table every time you hear the letter A. We have some things where we give sentences to repeat, and all of these describe the different domains in the brain that we talked about, cognitive domains. The mini cog. Um, is a smaller version where we have you like here draw a clock and put in a specific time and do a recall of words like we have here and it's just on the smaller scale. This one is the slums that we also use is more extensive. This was developed by the Veterans Administration and is used extensively. Again dementia is our umbrella term. The four common types of dementia that worldwide are Alzheimer's dementia, as you see here, vascular dementia, and that's usually um, paired with someone that might have had a heart attack or stroke, secondary to like, unfortunately, our Western diet. And so we have a lot of cardiovascular disease. Also, this one here is Lewy body. Um, that kind of goes along with our Parkinson's and frontal temporal. Also, we have where usually our patients, at least around age 85 and older, if they do have one type of dementia, they may have another. So we also have mixed dementia. Alzheimer's dementia is the most common type. We talk about an early stage, a middle stage, a moderate, and a late stage. One can be diagnosed early, that is before age 65. And unfortunately, those persons with early onset Alzheimer's dementia, their outcome is not very good and their decline is usually rapid. Those with late onset dementia, um, we usually label that anyone that's 65 and older. Um, the main feature for Alzheimer's is memory loss and this occurs slowly. Um, some of the risk factors are trauma, Down syndrome, chronic diseases like diabetes and hypertension, also, we found some genetic components like having apoprotein um, E3. 
those are some of the things that are associated. Um, also, sometimes we will do imaging, but you'll know if you come to see us, we don't always take a picture or head image because oftentimes the effects are not seen till later in life or death. Here's just an example where if you could see the size difference, this is the normal brain of someone who is in the trendsetter population, and this is a smaller brain. You see here the difference here where there's destruction of the brain mass compared to this one. Okay, I know you may not remember all of the patients. Anybody in particular have a thought before I move on? I'll give it 30 seconds. The gentleman, that's the one I'm gonna say. That's the one you're gonna say, awesome. Very good. So Mr. Juan Soto, yes. So his was a gradual onset. And I don't know if anyone has seen this maybe in their friends or their loved ones as well, where you just notice things over a period of time. And some of you may be caregivers already for your loved ones um, that may be experiencing this. So this gentleman may resonate with you. Okay. Our next topic is vascular dementia. And the symptoms and presentation will vary a little based on the location of where someone has an injury in their brain, where the stroke is. Um, additional risk factors for vascular dementia include smoking, abnormal cholesterol levels, um, metabolic diseases such as diabetes and so forth. And what we see is a rapid change in how one thinks and also their function. Um, and again, what we know is that this is closely associated with vascular, cardiovascular risk factors. And most people usually do not have only vascular dementia. Um, there's only about 10 to 20% of the population truly only has vascular dementia. They usually have it coupled with another type. And this one, what it's showing is an image. This is a 71-year-old female. These are our actual patients that we were able to take images of or collect their images. And where you see the white um, kind of figures here, that's the area of injury in their brain. Anybody think to think of any of our pitch our patients that we met earlier that can fit that fits this description? All right. The first woman. Very first good. Stroke, yes. You guys are awesome. <laughs> We're doing good as a group here. So our first patient, thank you, is Mrs. May Lee. Yes, and hers was sudden. But what was happening with her is she was having multiple strokes or many strokes as well. And that's what our family has seen. And as you might have heard this in some of your other lectures, but anytime you see someone with a change in the way they're thinking, all of a sudden slurred speech, um, weakness, falling over, get them to a healthcare facility quickly to be evaluated because your brain is time. And so they could be having a stroke um, and that's often associated with vascular dementia. And so this is, the, the dementia part is a residual, the after effect. And as you noted with her, she's very tearful. Some people have sudden changes in their mood from being happy to crying at the snap of the finger, um, from knowing what's happening to an hour later forgetting what's happening. Okay. The next one that we're going to talk about is Lewy body dementia. And this is the second most prevalent one. Um, usually people will have what we call Parkinsonism or features that are associated with Parkinson's disease, such as having a tremor, in just maybe one limb, like a hand or both. They can have hallucinations. They can have all of a sudden they were able to walk, right? But in the past three months, now they're not able to walk too well and they've had two falls. They can't turn a corner and they used to walk or even run, but now they're having trouble like turning. Also, they kind of have like a, um, what we call facies. And it's kind of like, an expressionless or a face that doesn't change expression. So they might also have poor sleep. So oftentimes 
when people come to see us in the office, they will talk about their poor sleep, that they might have very vivid um, nightmares to they can't go to sleep and they're seeing things that they know shouldn't be there and the shuffling gait. Their memory is intact and their functioning is intact initially, but these are usually the presenting signs. And so um, with this diagnosis, usually when we put Lewy body and that includes Parkinson's disease, the dementia comes in when they, we feel that they have one of two of the areas, the cognitive domain or abnormal, plus they have two of these other issues here like hallucinations, um, their cognition varies, they have trouble sleeping and so forth. This is just an example right here shows the area of injury. This is a normal area. This is the substantia nigra in the brain. And this is what we do know that this is abnormal in Lewy body dementia. Okay, so we won't go into all the, these details, but they'll be available if you like to read them later. So we also have frontal temporal dementia. And here, people usually come into our office with their loved ones saying that this person had a sudden personality change. They were like sweet as pie. They're very considerate. They're always willing to help. But now all of a sudden they've said the meanest things to people that are very insensitive and we're not understanding what's happening. Um, also, maybe they're not able to walk very well and they just have also bizarre behaviors. This person or these type of patients usually present earlier in age from about age 45 to 65. They still can present later on. And usually when we do imaging, um, if it's showing up at this time, the atrophy or the shrinkage of the brain will be in the front part like we talked about and in the temporal regions or lobes of the brain. A big factor, um, which is also in Lewy body is apathy, where it's not that one is depressed, but just doesn't care. <laughs> they don't care that the, the building is burning. They don't care that you stubbed your toe. And also those disinhibitions are gone. So again, things that they wouldn't have said in the past, now they're saying it all. Um, and also a little bit harder sometimes to detect this type of patient, because when we give them our of our 60 mental status exams, that we could possibly use, they usually do pretty good on it initially. They found that the MOCA works a little bit better. So again, we use these only as tools and listen to the whole story, the whole history. And they feel our researchers have discovered that only about 15 to 40% of these patients have a genetic component. Okay, which Do one are patients? Dr. Bailey Taylor, I just wanted to let you know probably five more minutes, and then if we could take questions after that, that would be great. Okay. All right, thank you. So I'm going to skip ahead. This is Mr. Mark Winters. So he is our example of someone that has gone through this sharp personality change, doing bizarre behaviors, and so forth in an earlier stage. Okay. One of the things we use here is called our FAST scale, and this helps us talk about the different stages of dementia. This is used universally. I'll just spend a little bit, of, like maybe two minutes on this one, and then we'll go to the next slide. Um, number one is there's no difficulty to number four, where there's de decreased ability to perform complex staff tasks like planning dinner, um, paying your bills, doing your checkbook, to here, around six, and that's where a lot of patients come in to see us at our office. We want to find out that people are having trouble way in this area to help lessen some of the effects of dementia. Um, when someone gets to 7A, and this is where they're only able to speak about six words or less, and that's when they qualify for hospice at that point. What I like to say as a reminder and just thinking about it, that dementia is development in reverse. So we have as a baby, if you have grandchildren, nieces and nephews, they have to be able to sit up. Then you smile at them, they smile back. They say sounds, words, complex sentences, can do taxes and essays to all of a sudden now forgetting how to walk, what to do in the bathroom, how to, um, what to do with the checkbook. 
So that's kind of what happens in general. The different types, again, um, of dementias may present differently, but towards the middle of the end, they behave similarly. There's different stages. There's early, moderate, and late. And the thing is just to think about delusions, agitations, aggression, wandering. Depression is usually around our middle to moderate stage. Okay, and also sundowning can occur at that stage as well. And that's where in the afternoon or evening that you'll see characteristically, our loved ones or patients or friends will be confused or have very abnormal behaviors or agitation. There is hope. There are things that we can do. Um, some of those things that we can to help lessen dementia if it's diagnosed and things that we can do to help. Um, we don't know exactly again what causes the trigger to turn on, but physical activity, avoiding depression, socialization, avoiding falls and trauma. Um, you can jump off of an airplane, but still use your safety gear. Uh, managing chronic diseases, um, brain activity like our word games and music, art, the things that bring pleasure, those are all helpful things. And also things that reduce stress and healthy eating. Okay. All right, I'll go ahead and open to questions. I know it was very quick at the end. Yeah, that's wonderful. And, and you all, we can dive in a little bit more. Um, Anne asked the question, is there such a thing as having a left brain or right brain skill? Yes, so left and right brain. And that's usually where we associate the difference between someone who may be more artistically minded, um, abstract thinking, and none, is, none of it's wrong or right, but it's just some people have dominance on one side of the brain or the other versus one that's more computational, more um, say maybe like building or spatial, visual spatial awareness. So yes, that still exists. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's great. Okay, the next question is, how do you schedule a family member for an evaluation? Okay, so if you want to particularly come to our office, what one would do is you can call, let me go back up to our number, and what we do is we ask your primary, here it is, your um, primary care provider to give a referral, but if you call our office, we can help you with that and you can set up that appointment. So we just need the referral and then we get you put into our queue and get an appointment. Also, some um, primary care doctors, family physicians, general medicine doctors may do the basic screening as well. We have our Center for Success in Aging, the Memory Health Program, to come alongside your provider because it does take more time. We may spend two hours with you so that we can get to the bottom and figure out what's going on and how we can help you. And we don't wanna take away from what they're doing, but to be their partner with you. Wonderful, that's great. Um, okay, one question. Could you please explain a little bit more about the frontal temporal dementia? Yes, so our frontal temporal dementia, and I guess may I ask what, tell me exactly what you want to know about that one. If that, um, what was that question, Dan? Is there something specific you'd like to know? That was your question. So, um, okay. but I'll, if he's not there, but what I can do is just tell you that, so with frontal temporal dementia, what I gave you is a generalization. There are some subtypes. Um, some of the subtypes or the one that I described the most was the behavioral variant. And that's where the abnormal behaviors. The progressive supranuclear palsy, that one is where we'll find that there may be like an eye, abnormal eye movement first, like vertical eye movement, as well as it's like a rapid decline. And, um, and I've had patients with that. And it's at first, if you're not aware, it can be very striking, like what is happening? And, it, and like I said, it's a very rapid decline with that one. Also our primary progressive aphasia, and that is where like with language, so we have different types of memory, like the memory that you use, um, say maybe you learn some words or you're, someone asks you a question. So you have part of what they ask you in your temporary memory 
and you kind of put that together to answer the question, some people are unable to process that information with the appropriate speed or remember that detail. And so that's kind of where this primary progressive aphasia comes in. These often, we have to do a lot of testing and again, a lot of history to rule out to come to these diagnoses. So sometimes it's hard because it takes time to get to these diagnoses. Got it, okay, that's wonderful. Does the fact if somebody has had trouble sleeping all of their life, is, um, could that be a possible cause of any of these types of dementia? So, and we do look at that because some people have always had trouble sleeping, but then we look at, and so we don't just use that only in isolation, but that is good to know, especially if you haven't had trouble and now all of a sudden you have trouble. Also, what we found is that people who don't get enough sleep, so sleep hygiene is something that I emphasize. And even for myself, I struggle with, there's not enough time in the day, but we have to get good sleep because it affects so many areas of our body, including our brain, as well as our heart health as well. So, um, and even, especially if you have sleep apnea, you definitely want to get that treated as well because that, that does increase your risk for stroke and dementias as well. Great, I'm gonna turn it back over. I think Mary Lou's. I yes. Probably, yes, okay, I'll let Can you Can y'all hear me? Uh, but uh, the only problem is, at least I didn't get all of those questions. I got a few over here and I'll okay. ask those, okay. Yeah, so the one that we're at Mary Lou is the one that says how many people recognize these symptoms in themselves. Do you see that one? No, I didn't get okay. that one. I'll, I'm not I'll sure keep going. I'll okay. keep going and when you see a duplicate, you jump in. So, okay. There, there, <laughs> There's our question. How many people recognize this in themselves? So that I don't know. So I have not actually done a survey or read that. But what I found is that patients usually in the initial stages of dementia, when we've been able to identify it to moderate, it's sometimes difficult when they figure that out that, you know what, you know, sometimes it's shocking to learn that you have a new illness or chronic disease. And then some people have brought themselves in to see us and said, you know, Dr. Bailey, this is going on, I'm concerned. And sometimes I've had a lot of patients as well that have presented because they have noticed different things, but maybe they're going through grief or depression that's been untreated. So also, there are a lot of people have had trauma in their life, even as a child or a young adult that's never been addressed until they're older. And so sometimes those are the things we have to rule out as well. All right, that's um, a great answer. So the next question is, if you have several members of your family that have this type of dementia or any type, is um, more likely that you would be getting that? Is that hereditary? Yes, yeah, so then what we would recommend is surveillance. And so we do do that as well, where you might come to see us twice a year. And that's just to do an assessment to see how you're doing. And we encourage you to take care of like the things, like I mentioned the risk factors, like to exercise, have a healthy diet, um, see your doctor regularly to make sure that things like heart disease, um, other chronic illnesses, high cholesterol, all those things are taken care of. And um, also things like um, alcohol, not that you can't drink, but to drink in moderation. Because for some people, sometimes even the moderate to heavy drinkers can have an effect that we've, we've found. So those are some of the things that you could do to be on the alert. Okay, great. So the next question is, is a slight shrinking of the brain normal in aging? Yes, so our brain does decrease as we age. And even sometimes we'll get reports from the radiologist that will say atrophy or shrinkage consistent with age. Now with dementia, like we talked about is when all of a sudden we'll get a reading or report that says the shrinkage is abnormal or greater than um, or does not correlate with the patient's age. That's when we're concerned. Okay. And Dr. Okay. Bailey, can you go, do you have the one, Mary Lou, are you ready? Yeah, to uh, sure? well, I, I think we just have uh, one more question. Is that correct? There's one or, more about the um, hopes for cures. Cures, or hopes yeah, for I think that's an important cost. one. Yeah. What are the hopes for cures and hopes to determine the cause? So we, there are several people worldwide doing research on this. And so even one of our studies that we've been working on is a training, a cognitive training, and that 
I can't tell you all the information just in case you all decide you want to participate in it. Um, one of our studies is for adults that have not been diagnosed with dementia and that they will go through this type of training and they'll be followed for five years. And we're trying to see if that will help to slow down the onset of dementia. We have another study that hopefully will get approved and it's for patients with dementia where we also do an intervention. And that's just, that's one or two examples of where we're trying to prevent and where we're trying to treat. But the people are doing studies worldwide on um, to figure out what is the um, etiology. Another study that um, with USC School of Medicine that we're looking at, or will be looking at, waiting for approval is where we do some blood sampling and also look at different risk factors and history factors of our patients to see if we can find some connections with the diagnosis of dementia. Okay. Uh, you know, just aside, uh, uh, the OLLI group might be a good source of that study, a part awesome. of the participants for the study. Um, we could put that on our bulletin even. Yes. You know, right, Heidi? Absolutely, and, yes. And get, if, if that's uh, of interest, Dr. Bailey, just follow it up with is. and we can do that. I think I would be interested in helping with that. Well, thank um, you all. Um, uh, now, that was another question. How do we sign up for your study? <laughs> okay. Or other study. So yes. That's perfect. You guys are awesome because one of my jobs, I'm tasked with helping with the recruitment phase. And so we are just getting all of our final government um, federal approval, and then we can officially invite you. So you all will be at the top of the list where we will give you the contact information and all of that. And we would love for you to participate. That's perfect. <laughs> okay. um, another person asks, what about treatment and medications uh, currently? Yes, yeah, so unfortunately, we still have the same set of meds. They're still good. Um, we have we don't have any new medications. So you might have heard of some like Aricep. You've heard of maybe Namenda. You might have heard of Manzarek, which is a combination of Aricep and Namenda, Galantamine, Exelon. Those are the type of meds that we have now. Um, we use those to kind of they slow down the process of dementia. For some of them, will help with. Um, cognition will help to enhance the cognition. Um, some will help with some of the depression or adverse behaviors that sometimes occur, and they don't work for everybody. But those are like the basic meds that we have. I believe Dr. Absher, he's probably talked about more about the more common research in the actual pharmacologic agents. So um, that information is out there. I don't have those at the top of my list. Um, but they are there. Okay. Uh, one person says, and I think everybody would agree with this, could we have a copy of your slides? Yes, today? you can. You Good. can. Um, and one another person asked, what are adult day programs? See, I might have missed some of these questions when I signed off and signed on. Excuse me if I did. Oh, no problem. So adult day programs, they can vary. But in general, some adult day programs can be a simple program where um, our trendsetters gather together and they have social activities and um, that center may be responsible just for some oversight while they're there to programs where they provide medical care. They might be a physician, nurse practitioner present. Um, we also have more formal programs like our PACE program. And that's for our elderly patients, basically, that may qualify for Medicare, Medicaid, and their resources are pooled together, and they provide transportation activities, medical care on site, even therapy as well. And um, the providers there will follow the patients from their home, if they have to go to the hospital. The goal is to keep people out of um, traditional facilities, for, per se. Okay, so it's still considered uh, better for people to stay in their own space, is that? It, it varies, and so even when you come to see us in the office or even if we see us in the hospital, so each case and each person and each family situation is unique. Our, in general, we find that staying in one's environment um, with the things that one is used to and routine and all of that are helpful, but also we have to look at what resources are at home so some people are at home, but no one else can be at home with them. Maybe they have to work. Maybe 
the family, the patient cannot afford 24 hour care if our loved one is at that point. Also being aware, can we physically take care of our loved ones such as some people are willing to have their mom at home, their sister at home, but they may not be able to change a brief if needed. They may not be able to take care of or handle when there's that personality change or the paranoia kicks in. So for some families, they do have to choose um, like a residence or a memory care unit or a long-term care unit. And that I always remind them is still, you're still loving your loved one, your family member, but you're also recognizing what your limitations are and what their limitations may be. Because I hate, I do, you don't ever want to be accused of abuse unintentionally and just, you know, sometimes that's happened. So we've helped families because it's not that they didn't care, weren't trying to take care of their loved one, but maybe they didn't know how to take care of a wound or to know that you must have a nurse at least come and help manage that. Oh, well, that's excellent. I think that's a good one to end on. Uh, and uh, it is time for us to end this. Uh, thank you so much from all of us, Dr. Bailey Taylor. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing the possibility that we might help with the study. Yes, thank uh, you. If people want your uh, name and contact information, would that be acceptable for us to yes. send? Yes, I will okay. put that. Let me stop sharing here and I can send that in the slide. Uh, and email to, to and you. And I have got that. If anybody needs that, they can email me to um, Dr. Bailey Taylor. So we appreciate it, you all. Mm -hmm. Really was wonderful time together. And thank you again for your time. And this really yet another wonderful and important topic. Thank, thank you all. Thank you. And let's hear it for Elise too.